Wonderful. As folks continue to join us, I want to just uh, extend a, a welcome to everybody who's gathered here this evening with us for Palmer Memorial Episcopal Church's Great Wednesday webinar series. Uh, we are thrilled um, to have Padraig Otuma with us tonight. Uh, we've had some amazing uh, guests um, this past month. We had Joy Harjo, uh, poet, poet laureate of the United States. Uh, tonight, Padraig will continue that, that theme of poetry and, and story sharing, as we've discussed. Um, but let me do a quick introduction uh, to Padraig. Um, before I do that, just a reminder that if you have questions, uh, the way this will flow is we will have um, about 40 minutes or so uh, of conversation between uh, Neil and Padraig, and then about 20 minutes or so uh, for question and answer. And so if you have a question, please put that in the, um, the, the box and I'll take care of it. And um, I think that's it. So let me give you uh, an introduction here real quick. So Padraig, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Irish poet and theologian Padraig Otuma's work centers around themes of language, power, conflict, and religion. He is the author of books of poetry and prose, four books of poetry and prose, Daily Prayer with the Cori Mila Community, In the Shelter, Sorry for Your Troubles, and Readings from the Books of Exile. He presents the podcast Poetry Unbound with On Being Studios, where he also has responsibilities in bringing art and theology into public and civic life. From 2014 to 2019, he was the leader of the Cori Mila community, Ireland's oldest peace and reconciliation community. He's based in Ireland and is coming to us tonight from New York City. So we're thrilled to have him here with us tonight. Again, I'm Roger Hutchison, Director of Christian Formation and Parish Life at Palmer. Please let me know if you have any questions and enjoy this evening. Neil, I turn it over to you. Great. Um, Patrick, uh, it's really a great honor to be able to speak with you um, uh, this evening. And for those who may not be uh, familiar with you, or maybe they only know a little bit about you, I'm, I wondered if you could start by just telling us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be someone who writes poetry and someone who <laughs> thinks about language, which that is a topic in itself is something that really interests me, but who's also a theologian. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Neil, and thanks, Roger, for the intro, and thank you, everybody, for um, coming along. I'm in New York City at the moment. I'm on a seven-month um, poetry residential, or oh, poetry residency with um, Columbia University. Um, I, poetry has always felt like it's been part of my life. It's a very strong component of school in Ireland, so there was never an opportunity to get away from it, but uh, I always did love it. I always would re would read in advance over the summers the poems that were going to be coming up in school that year and learn some of them by heart um, before I needed to. Um, and I just found myself turning to poetry to make sense of my world, even, even as an 11-year-old and as a 12-year-old, writing terrible poetry <laughs> throughout my teenage years, some of which I was embarrassed for anyone to see. So I wrote it in code, and then I promptly forgot what the code was. So <laughs> I... Uh, I suppose there was a way within which somehow they're just doing that over years, even very bad poetry, and then reading very good poetry. Um, that, that I suppose gave me a language. And for me, I'm always looking for a language for trying to understand the world, like all of us, I think. Um, a language to speak about God, a language to speak about colonization, a language to speak about why in Ireland we speak English rather than Irish or Gaelic, as you'd call it. Um, a language to speak about history, a language to speak about grief and love and the places where we are. I, I've always been looking for language and, and poetry is one of those for me. And theology is another. Right. Uh, and all of them really are attempts to take 20, well, in English anyway, to take 26 little shapes and then lots of blank space and to say something that for a moment holds meaning. We're all doing that all the time, whether in conversation with our friends or um, whether in other ways, and poetry is just one more attempt to look at the world. Has, has, has poetry and theology always been intertwined for you, whether it's, whether it's, you know, direct or indirect? I was, I was thinking of something I heard Christian Wyman say in an interview where he, he thought that all poets are believers, even if they say they're not. Yeah. Um, I don't know, is that, is that a distinction that, or is it, I mean, has it always kind of been intertwined in your work or? 
In my work, yeah. I mean, I, I've been thrilled, I think, by the language of prayer and the language of poetry for a very long time. I remember the first time that I paid, it, paid attention at an Anglican service where there was that line, you are the same God whose nature is always to have mercy. Yeah. And I remember thinking, what gorgeous language. I mean, the formulation of that is beautiful. Whatever you think about what's being proposed there, you are the same God whose nature is always to have mercy. I remember being hugely moved by that and saying it over and over again because the music of it said something. Right. And um, that for me, it's the music that's at the heart of a poem or a prayer that, that often draws me because that the music hints at the thing that the line of a poem or a prayer holds that's beyond the evidence of the language within that. It's it's somehow a little piece of life that's that's held in those words that's that's pointing you to something that motivated the words or something in you that responds to the words that makes the words big it took me a long time to feel confident in that though i was frightened of theology even though i was very religious i was frightened of it because you know it, it came with such a language of power and authority that i often didn't have the confidence to pay attention to the the artistry that i wanted to bring to it because i was worried about upsetting the lord god almighty and being sent to hell I always think of the phrase um, at the post-communion prayer in the traditional that airs through hope of my everlasting kingdom. And mm. it just it just it just goes around and around in my, yeah. in my head. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was I was in London just before the pandemic. Um, I was doing a few poetry events uh, at a church in London. And they asked if I'd preach on the Sunday morning and that I'd preach twice. One at the, I, did they call it the 1669 service, the early Book of Common Prayer service right. at 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning. And it was beautiful. The devices and desires of our heart. Oh, what? Heart, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. It was, I loved it. And then I met this crowd of absolute anarchists, all of whom make sure. the point going to the 8 a.m. 1669 service. And we had magnific magnificent Sunday morning coffee afterwards. So, yeah, <laughs> you, you mentioned uh, talking about the different languages um, in Ireland, and I heard you once talk about language as part of your spiritual background and growing up speaking English and Irish. Yeah, you referred to the latter as the lang quote, the language that came from this earth of Ireland, which I thought was a beautiful turn of phrase and how that had grown more important to you over the years. Yeah, because it's something that goes to your bones in your own life. And I wonder if you could say something about that or just sense of place that everyone has this some kind of a sense of place whether they carry it from the past or whether yeah. it's something they root in the present or i don't know what what talk to us about that well, it's it's hard for me to stop talking about it neil so i'll have to make sure to try to say something concise um i mean so the first thing that comes to mind is that i'm speaking to you at the moment from second avenue in new york and this is lenape land so of course the languages of lenape and Delaware people would have been spoken here for hundreds of years before the arrival of Europeans. And often when I'm walking around Manhattan, I find myself thinking about what did the soil way deep underneath the concrete of the roads here? What did the soil hear? The trees that were here before, what did they hear? And what were the names given to the contours of the land? And how, the, how did the land shape the contours of the language? And I think for any person who comes from a place where a language was um, deliberately decimated in the name of overthrowing a people, there is a way within which to speak, uh, uh, to speak a language that has, that has been impoverished in its daily fluency is an act of courage, an act of resistance and resilience, um, an act of hope, an act of art and an act of lamentation altogether. So the first thing about language is that it is it is public and it is political and it is shaped by the land where it grew up, the contours and the landscape. Um, and so for me, there's something about knowing that my ancestors spoke Irish, all of them, right. um, and that there, it was through deliberate policy, not just by kind of random evolution and changes in demographics, demographics. it was deliberate policy. That, in for, that forced that language to be a language of shame or to be a language where people say it in that language to their children, don't speak this one, speak the other one, because you'll get a job if you speak the other one. And that, I think, um, motivates me <laughs> to, to think about the dignity of a language. And yeah, and then even deeper than that is the fact that languages are beautiful. I mean, English is a beautiful language too. I have nothing against it. I, it's my most fluent language. 
but Irish carries a special place in my heart because I've been speaking it since I was two, albeit not with great grammar. Um, but I, 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 I need Irish in my life in order to make sense of the world. I love what you said about what, what did the soil here, what did the trees here, and it reminded me of a, a once I, someone was talking about giving a sermon from a different perspective, and in a way that I would never have imagined on my own. They said, like, even pick an object, mm-hmm. like the oil or the, the, the things that were being brought to the tomb to anoint yeah. the body of Jesus. What had, the, what had those things seen beforehand? Yeah. What were they seeing as that was happening? And I would never have thought about that, but I, and I wonder if kind of, you know, a poet in some ways is giving that kind of different perspective that's surprising or, you know, um, yeah. I, I didn't think of it that way. I wouldn't have, mm-hmm. I don't know. Well, I think so much in the world can be improved by having multiple exercises for reconsidering your point of view right. and an exercise like that one you're quoting, you know, to take a short text that you're reading from a sacred text and to not just think, what's the message? What does it mean? But rather to, th- to think, how would that lamp that held the oil have described the story? Um, what else did that lamp do? What, what happened afterwards? Um, was there anybody there in the text who wished they weren't there? Right. Was there anybody who had a question or a curiosity? Um, what did they do the next day? All of those questions bring in all kinds of extraordinary points of view, and suddenly the relationship with the text changes, and you find that the text is breathing, not just in the sense of here is the singular authoritative interpretation of this text, but rather the text, like all literature, is yearning for a partner in exploring the meaning that it is, un- that it is unfolding today. So speaking of language, one of the strangest things in sermons, one of the strangest things that happens once in a blue moon is when after a worship service, someone is retelling you back what they heard in a sermon. And you're thinking, I don't think that I actually said that, but maybe that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Or what does that happen to non-preachers too? Like I, I would, you know, whether it was people okay. reading poetry or your. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I should say, it sounds like there's a kettle boiling in the background, but it's my radiator that's just come on. Um, if I don't turn it on, if I don't leave it on, my, my flat will, and um, I'll start to see my breath in my flat. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it happens anytime somebody speaks in public, for good and for ill, you know. Right. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's not always people, possible, right. Yeah, there'll be people here who are in roles of leadership. And, well, you know, in civic society, in a church, in a school, in a business, and they'll hear it quoted back to say, that time you said, and they might go, I didn't say it. And, <laughs> but, but then also, in, especially in places where people are imparting meaning, right. um, people will hear, I mean, Rilk or um, Rumi said, what you seek is seeking you. And I think that sometimes can be a curse, but it can also from time to time be a great consolation. Because sometimes that very thing you're yearning to hear um, speaks back to you. And those words also take on profound meaning. And they might have been throwaway words from whoever was using right. them in public. That makes sense. Um, yeah. Could you talk, you, one of the things you, you were discussing, talking about tonight is the possibility of re- reading religious texts as poetry. Mm-hmm. Um, could you tell us what you mean by that or what you're well, thinking about in that regard? I mean, I, I suppose I, on a broad sense, I. The reason why I have found it, found it possible to continue to pay attention to religious texts is because I, 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 I think that they were primarily written by artists. Mm. You know, the Jeremiah was so filled with yearning and lament. You know, he, he said, um, you are to me a deceiving stream and I curse the day when I was born. What extraordinary metaphor, you know, metaphor, simile for him to use. You are a deceiving stream. How can a stream deceive you? What an amazing thing. Is he calling God a mirage? What's he saying? How amazing. And I curse the day I was born. And so to pay attention to Jeremiah as artist primarily, rather than um, somebody that's telling you, here's the singular interpretation of the mystery that we call God or the question that we call God. That, I think, suddenly opens up any sacred text as one side of a conversation that's asking for a response side of a conversation and generation after generation, century after century. And it asks individuals who are reading those texts to take the text seriously, but also to take their reading capacity seriously. What do I think? And there's something really powerful about that, especially for so many of us 
who have been affected by religious environments that say, here is the singular interpretation and get it right or burn, or get it right and be outside of the congregation, or get it right and be deemed a threat, etc. I think there's something in the in the Christianities, especially that so many people inhabit, that that in a religion that says that it is, that at its heart is the idea that in love there is no fear, there is an extraordinary amount of fear in the love that we profess. And I think, therefore, it's been really worthwhile to practice the art of seeing religious text as primarily written by artists who themselves were on the outside. They were not the appointed people, you know, to write. They were often the ones who had the repository and the archive of narrative in them, even though they weren't given formal space in their community. And so, therefore, the, the text itself is a, an act of almost rebellion against a systematizing idea. It's exactly. a shame that often the texts are, are used for systematizing. And I was thinking, you know, and I, I think I've, I feel like I've learned a lot about that from the Jewish tradition about of the course, yeah. reading, but then yeah. also a great appreciation, kind of what you were saying um, about the Hebrew scriptures, the, the willing, this kind of self-criticism, like it's not all some kind of royal propaganda, you know, there's, there's the, the there's a critique, uh, self critique or the critique of society and that kind of thing, which yeah, is totally obviously can be expressed in a different way. Are, are there some things you would like to read to us that relate to this? Uh, yeah, poems that you can read? yeah I've, got, I've got a few and uh, I'll try to keep an eye on your face for when you're telling me, um, <laughs> shut up, Patrick. <laughs> um, We'd love to hear some. Yeah, well, here's one called, here's a new one called The First Fight it's set in Eden or in mountains near Eden, I should say. The first fight. Afterwards, Adam wandered round, naming things. Mountain, he said, covered in sweat from a day's hike. Then earthquake, watching forests fall between the earth's shifting plates, and breeze as he cooled down. God arrived unnoticed. Avoidance, God said, and Adam turned round. Who invited you? Eve sent me, God replied. She's naming all the things that are underneath the earth, things that will cause the rising and the falling of many other things. Adam sat down and began to cry. Tears, he said, and rage and frustration at all I feel and cannot say and shut up. God interrupted. Adam turned around. God had gone away. And here's another one called Make Believe. Again, an Eden prayer or an Eden poem. Make Believe. And on the first day, God made something up. Then everything came along. Seconds, sex, and beasts and breaths and rabies, hunger, healing, lust and lusts, rejections, swarming things that swarm inside the dirt, girth and grind and grit and shit and all shit's functions, rings inside the tree trunk and branches broken by the snow, pigs' hearts and stars, mystery, suspense and stingrays, insects, blood and interests and death. Eventually us with all our viruses, laments and curiosities, all our songs and made up stories and our songs about the stories we've forgotten and all that we've forgotten, we've forgotten. And to hold it all together, God made time and those rhyming seasons that display decay. I really like that one. <laughs> uh, why? I'm always curious why people say that. Well, I, I well the, for uh, for some reason the stingray reference just made me smile. But the, yeah. all the things that we've forgotten that we've forgotten, <laughs> um, and 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 I don't I don't know. Just sort of naming that all the complexities of life. I mm. so it's true. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is exactly why I was trying. What I was trying to do in writing it, I realized afterwards. I mean. Initially, I was just kind of following the thread of the intuition sure. of the poem, but I suppose I was trying to think of, you know, I, I suppose the, 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 the theological imagination that I was often imparted with is that, first of all, 
everything was perfect, then humanity came and everything was imperfect. Right. And, and I suppose, I mean, I don't find that an interesting imagination, nor do I find it the concern of the Hebrew Bible. I suppose I was trying to write a, po a poetry where the complexity of life was recognizable. Well, you know, speaking of the complexity of life, uh, and, and we can come back to some more creation poems if you want to, but when you said that phrase, it makes me think of like the book of Psalms. And one of the things I do love about the Anglican, about the Anglican tradition of Christianity is that the Psalms are important in daily prayer and in weekly prayer, uh, you know, worship on Sundays, and that they're and that they're a treasured part of the spiritual life. And I love that that the Book of Common Prayer includes the entire Psalter, so it doesn't just include the the pretty parts and the beautiful yeah. parts and the uplifting parts, but it also includes the angry parts, um, yeah. directed not toward others but toward God, mm -hmm. uh, and that includes you know the expressions of devastation and crying out from the bottom of the pit and wanting to be brought out of that constricted space and to, uh, and to be able to breathe deeply and freely in a, in a broad and wide space. Um, have the Psalms uh, had an impact on your spiritual life or, or in the way you think about poetry here? Yeah. So I, a number of years ago, I read Robert Alter's book, The Art of Biblical Poetry. Yeah. Um, and it, it was such a helpful set of um, almost literary invitations to be able to pay attention to the text. Um, I mean, there's, I've always been delighted by this tiny little, um, uh, I'm not sure what you'd call it, um, a tiny little style that you find in some of the Hebrew poems. Two things I've desired, three things I ask. I just, I find that lovely. And then they might mention four things, you know, <laughs> but really it's just talking about a handful, a few right. things in your hand. And I love that style. And I love that somehow whoever it was that was writing those particular Psalms was paying attention to the idioms of daily speech and that there's ordinariness and um, the kind of things that people were saying, whether in their writing or in their reciting or, or in their speech um, present there. I mean, the Psalms are interesting in the sense of that some of them are saying it's terrible. You know, a thousand right. people fall on my right, 10,000 people sure. fall on my left, you know, basically a million people falling everywhere. And then they turn to say, yet I will praise you. And I think sometimes you can hear the tension of the poet there trying to think, do I want to end on this note? And yeah. sometimes I wish they did, and sometimes they do. And sometimes I don't appreciate the turn to try to prove that everything is right. great or is going to turn out great. But other t I can really appreciate that that was an impulse of the artist to try to do that. And I, I can hear the tension. So often poetry is filled with tension. And you can hear the tension in the, in the poet behind the Psalms when they do that. Um, and then there's other there's other psalms, you know, I lift my my eyes up to the mountain. Where does my help come from? My help comes from you, maker of heaven, creator of the earth. I love that psalm. I, I sing it regularly if I'm awake before dawn, somewhere where I can see mountains, i.e. not Manhattan. Um, <laughs> and there's something beautiful about that. And you just think, how, for how long have people been looking at the earth? And in that way, it is nature poetry to pay attention there and that this person was so moved by what they were seeing, by their morning habit of being up early, that they they elevated that to the level of, of a poem and the level of prayer. What a gorgeous thing to do. The Psalms also make me think of, you know, songs being sung. And and I, I, I do love Anglican chants and, yeah. and I love listening to the beauty of that, although sometimes there's a mismatch between the words and the yeah the, the language but it also yeah. makes me think of another part of the liturgy where i i don't usually think of the language of the creed as poetic even though there are beautiful <laughs> phrases like you know my favorite god of god light of light yeah, yeah. god of the nicene creed mm -hmm. but, but when i was a seminarian in um i believe i, I may have even asked joe uh harjo this question when i was a seminarian in a west indian anglo-catholic parish in stamford connecticut we would sing the creed, and I can still remember the opening part of that. Um, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. And, and when you sing the words, it, it does transform them into a kind of poetry. And it, and it also, for some people, for some people who struggle with the words, it makes it easier for them to express the words. Yeah. And uh, when if they're saying them, they might be thinking about them or I wrestle with this. And there's something mysterious to me about that. And I'm wondering, you know, as a poet, 
do you have, I mean, do you ever think much about the interaction between poetry and music? Have any of your, has many of you, any of your own poetry been set to music? Yeah, yeah, some of them have. In fact, I started off as a singer-songwriter. Um, oh, really? <laughs> I, yeah, I released an album once. <laughs> about 20 people listened to it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I mean, lyric poetry in English is so called because it's kind of taken in from the Greek tradition of when people would recite poetry, they'd have a little, a tiny little harp, the lyre, which you hear of in the, in the, in the Psalms as well, which would be very lightly strummed while they were reciting poetry. And so lyric poetry is a way of, des of, of describing the fact that all music is a certain kind of is a certain kind of music, like an instrument, an instrument being strummed. And sometimes the music is in the repeated sounds, so in rhyme or in assonance or in alliteration. Sometimes it's in the gaps, though, and sometimes it's in its discordance. And so, therefore, I think when you listen to a piece of text that you might normally have approached, like a weighty theological speculation, you know, like I believe in one God, maker of heaven and earth, and you hear its song and a melody that moves you, it can go beyond the question of um, what does this mean? And it can really invite into the question of what is happening as I'm singing this. And I, I, therefore, I think any composer who puts a weighty theological text like a creed to music has a has a fascinating job of interpreting of interpreting, and those interpretations are never permanent. They're they're right. of their time. Um, I mean, you mentioned God from God, light from light. Like that is that that is a phrase that's much much older than Christianity. Right. And what I love is that those early, um, you know, people in those uh, those those councils suddenly thought, well, we like the poems from these pagans, let's steal it. <laughs> That's what poets have been doing for a very long time. In a way, poets are only ever trying to respond to the one great poem, which is the mystery of what it means to be alive, and trying to write in response to that. Now, you're interested not only in the ways that, you know, poetry and, and words can, um, can affect us, you know, if we're, maybe we're just reading them on their own, but also how how, how people are transformed in their relationships. I mean, that's work that you've done. And I was, first of all, I was really excited to see, um, read about, you know, your work with On Being. Um, yeah. uh, the Krista Tippett, um, uh, you know, host of On Being, uh, she lived in the same Episcopal house, the Berkeley mm -hmm. Center, for part of my time at Yale Divinity School. Mm -hmm. And I listened to the interview that you had with her a couple of years ago, and I was really struck by the story you were talking about uh, someone who perhaps counterintuitively wanted to know how many times his words had bruised others in a group, sp yeah. specifically LGBTQ folks in the yeah. room, I think. Mm -hmm. And and then finally, after after receiving all of this, finally asked the question, are you telling me that it's painful for you to be around me? Mm -hmm. And And you just talked about that moment. And then later you said that, you know, perhaps counterintuitively, given the general perspective of this man, you know, you say, I want to be someone like him who says, tell me what it's like to hear the way I talk mm -hmm. because I need to be changed. I want also to be converted. And I just thought that was a remarkable statement and observation and experience. And um, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could just talk about that. Well, I mean, at the heart in, in your picking up of that story, Neil, there's there's the recognition that in so much of our world, inside religion, inside politics, inside the conversations we have that matter, we are trying to navigate change. Um, maybe I'm trying to make someone else change. Maybe I'm trying to change myself. Maybe I'm wishing the political system would change or, or the, the priorities that I deem to be operational within economics or, or government would change. And what I saw on this man who, by his own admission, wa was... I mean, he, he wanted us to call him a fundamentalist and he, he used really harsh words about LGBT people, but something small had happened that had opened up his imagination. And as a result, he was the one that navigated his own change rather than anybody else trying to drag him kicking and screaming into a little bit less violent language. He was the one that said, when have, when have my words bruised you? And then, um, you know, and saying, I, he, you know, he was saying, I'm believing that it must be horrible to be around me. And um, and he wanted to hear that. Initially, people in the room were like, ah, you're fine, you're fine. And he was like, stop patronizing me. Answer my question. Basically, am I horrible to be around? And it was an extraordinary thing to watch him do that to himself. 
another man I know years ago said to me, I'm not really interested in any kind of legislation that would honor gay marriage in public. He said, you know, you've got civil civil partnerships or common law th- arrangements, you know. And then he said to me, the only thing that would make it different for me is if marriage were to come in, how would you feel, Podrick? We were friends. And I, I started to cry because I said, that would be an extraordinary thing, not as to whether I should or shouldn't get married, but the idea that this extraordinarily important word in the secular world, which is an understanding of love, that that would be something that would be understood to say, this isn't just in the remit of heterosexuals. And right. he... I, I mean, I didn't say that because I was crying. Yeah. And then he watched me and he said, I think I've just changed my mind. But he too was exploring the edges of his own imagination and not only the edges of it intellectually, he was exploring the impact of the way that he acted and thought. And I wish more men were like that. <laughs> you know, I want to be that kind of man. Um, but I do think it's the practice of you know all kinds of power and gender. But I, I, I often see men who would see that as a demonstration of weakness. And I don't see it as a demonstration of weakness. And I've worked in conflict resolution for many years, you know, because poetry wasn't making me um, help pay the rent. (laughs) Uh, And often in conflict resolution, you have conflict about unwillingness to change and unwillingness to even entertain the idea that you've something to learn, never mind change. And so I'm often moved when I meet people who are motivated and proud even to have a way within which suddenly they enact this thing that even the Gospels are curious about, metanoia, repentance, turning around. And they do that with a deep sense of conviction and courage. That's profoundly moving to see. And I will say that often it is people that I've witnessed from the more conservative end of religion that I think because they take the text so seriously, when they become um, enlightened to see that text can be read in another way than they had hitherto interpreted it. I see them as the seats of some of the most extraordinary demonstrations of conversion and change. I heard uh, once um, a priest who wrote about uh, you know same gender relationships and, and marriage. Maybe before that was really kind of on the scene, but um, talking about that kind of change or or kind of looking at texts in a different way. Uh, and describing it kind of like the little piece of sand that goes into the oyster, you know, and then eventually over time, you know, it becomes this this pearl and you, and you, you know, something new is kind of, a, uh, you discover something new. Um, and, and also in thinking about ordinary things, whether it's ordinary things in a poem or those little lines you mentioned in, in poetry, when thinking about the ways that congregations are uh, inclusive, for example, um, I have often thought about um, that this is a very important value for the, for our church and, and, and helping other people think about, well, how, how affirming and celebratory is your congregation? I sometimes bring it down to the, the most common thing, like, can you give altar flowers in thank, in, to the glory of God and thanksgiving for your marriage anniversary, you know, yeah. for a gender couple? And, and I, you know, we can talk about all kind of high-minded things, but just on a very basic level, you know, yeah. that means a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a poem I'll read. I mean, for me, the question, partly why I struggle so much as, uh, as someone who was who is Catholic, I suppose, by culture and affiliation, is because not just. I mean, the Catholic Church is filled with gay men, of course, sure. plenty, plenty of them in very senior positions in the Vatican, um, and some of them out, some of them not, etc. Some all of them living with a certain form of threat and enacting that threat too. The, my biggest problem as a Catholic is misogyny, because I think there is such a, a fundamental lack of recognition of the incarnated human experience that a church that says that that it is built on a sacramental, which is always a physical um, thing, that that there is a uh, that there is a lack of recognition of paying serious attention to the lives and the intelligence, the power and the contribution of women, all women, you know, and by just saying roles of leadership are not open to you. And so I'm often uninterested in seeing um, in seeing trendiness in theology. I want to see substance. Right. Um, and, you know, I sometimes get invited. There's lots of trendy churches that would be led by somebody, you know, with a big beard and sure. they might <laughs> podcast and they might be cool. Right. But they're nonetheless speaking uh, in ways that are deeply misogynist. And they would sooner invite a gay 
kind of agnostic Catholic poet than they would have a woman in their congregation speak. Right. I'll say no in those situations because right. I don't want to be complicit with being distracted by trendiness. Here's a little sonnet. It's not long. Um, called Who for Us Men and for Our Salvation. I'll read it for you. Um, here it is. And this sonnet was written for Sarah Williamson and Philippa Jordan, two uh, theologians in Belfast. Who for us men and for our salvation. You drink whiskey during poker nights, wear shirts your granddad wore, display the ink that's on your unshaved chest and sign your texts to me with X's. You drink coffee from a little glass after early morning yoga class. You podcast authenticity and live in parts of the city that others have disdained. You disdain disdain. You oil your beard. You wear 1930s shoes bought for a small fortune in a place you say your granddad would have loved. Like him, you believe a woman's place is not behind the pulpit. Let her lecture in literature. Let her explore the stars. Let her drink. Let her work. But do not let her speak the verb of God in public. Let her mostly be. Wow. Speak the ver verb of God in public. I, I'm going to remember that phrase. Mm -hmm. That's a great that, phrase. Oh, well, that's a direct translation from Irish, because oh. at the end in, in a church service, you know, when um, people might say, um, this is the word of the Lord. In, right. in Irish, you say, this is the verb of God. Shobri her day. I love that. Yeah. I think I there's that. a really practical reason why, though. And the really practical reason is because obviously you wouldn't have been saying that in English or Irish prior to 1965 in Vatican II. And right. when they were trying to translate the, the mass into the vernacular, you know, this is the word of the Lord. Um, if you try to say this is the word of the Lord in Irish, you say shaf fuckle day. And <laughs> I th because the word fuckle is the word for word. Right. And so, um, so Vince, I, I thought, I think somebody must have said, look, we can't be saying that. Like we need to say something else. And some clever person said, well, how about we say the verb? What and a great story. I think there's such an, ex I mean, uh, that's my speculation. I have not read that's that in right, history, but, no. but there is such an extraordinary richness, therefore, in saying yeah. the verb of God. Amazing. I love that because it's, it's, it's it, yeah, I love that because it's active. Mm -hmm. um, sort of like the difference in Advent, always like you were, you were sort of, waiting or whatever but it's I, I love the difference between wait we think of waiting as passive but that's why i like to use the word watching because Lovely. it's active yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's a very different image that comes to mind when you think about watching versus yeah. waiting around a doctor's office or something yeah but, for sure um, there's another phrase i wanted to ask you about and it goes back to that story of the the man who asked for the feedback and mm -hmm. you know wanted to know how his words were hurting other people and i think it was i think this was from an extension of you know, that relationship or talking with him or someone like him. And you use the phrase curiosity unfolded between us. Mm -hmm. And that really, that phrase again, stuck out in my mind. Um, and I like that for all kinds of settings in which we find ourselves as human beings or as people of faith or as strangers in a shared world. Yeah. And I'm wondering in thinking about that kind of phrase, curiosity unfolded between us, how would you nurture that kind of a spirit or kind of a desire to be fully alive in the company of other people? Mm. Well, I think curiosity is a great way to live your life. Um, mm -hmm. There is something so rich when you come in contact with a person who is curious, a person who says, and what did that mean for you and why? And that in the context of relationships, people can ask you and people can help you to pay attention to the story of your life. And um, I don't mean only in the dramatic experience of life. I mean, also in the everyday, you know, somebody says that they um, get off the bus a little bit earlier to walk the last bit to work. Tell me why, you know, what did you see this morning? Mm -hmm. Marie Howe is a good friend in the city in New York here. And often, you know, if I'm on the phone with her, if she's on a trip um, she'll just say, here's what I see out the window. And she'll just tell you what she sees. Sometimes it's beautiful. Sometimes it's, it's, it's the way the light is on a brick wall. Um, and there's something so interesting about nurturing curiosity in your life, not for the purpose of anything other than noticing. Right. But that, yeah. I think, 
uh, that as a muscle can help, therefore, when it comes to being in a situation where your curiosity is, might be feeling threatened or mm -hmm. where you might be deliberately withdrawing the possibility of thinking anything curious about a person who you find to be on the opposite side of some kind of argument or some kind of ideology or some kind of voting system. There is the possibility, I think, of nurturing curiosity in a way that can open us up to each other. And I don't mean some utterly bland middle of the road, sitting on the fence, not, you know, pretending we don't disagree. I'm interested in disagreeing absolutely deeply. And I think peace is built on the possibility of damn good arguments. But in order to have a damn good argument, what we need to do is to get beyond the idea that the other person has nothing interesting to think and has nothing interesting to say. Um, even if I disagree with them fundamentally on some element of politics or life, nonetheless, it might be still that I can find myself paying attention to the curiosity of how they live their life or their, their love for literature or their love for film. The idea that people who I disagree with don't have a profound relationship with art is a terribly demeaning imagination. And that's a projection and that's a commodification of withdrawing the possibility of being surprised by somebody. And that will always fail us. That will lead to a very, very predictable and continuing to be impoverished future. And I, I don't want that future. And it is already damaging us deeply. Um, so therefore, I think the, uh, the practice of curiosity is, first of all, a practice of the art of being alive. I don't want to just think that it is a way to commodify um, human curiosity for the purpose of a better no, political life. I was going to say, I love this as a word to Americans, especially uh, because we, we can too often, everything becomes utilitarian. Like, I'm curious for a reason or whatever, but just being curious for the sake of being curious and observing yeah. the world as you walk through it. And um, then that will serve you in other situations. Right. I do feel like, I mean, even on a, on, a, on a mundane level, I often think back to not the before times before the pandemic, but I mean, the really old times when I would read a newspaper from front to back and even for a sermon or just for my own, you know, well-being as a human being, the things that, that I was most fascinated were by were things I was not looking for, mm -hmm. but, I, and that was because I was, you know, of the way I was reading something as opposed to today, today, when I'm only clicking on something I'm interested in. And I don't yeah. know how you, um, you know, kind of open up the world around you to be, be curious. I, I did notice in the heart of the pandemic, you know, um, walking around the neighborhoods around where I live, a walking down streets that I don't naturally drive down, but then B seeing things that I never saw, even though they were right in front of me. Yeah. And I, I just observe, I just note that as a, it was, it was a, it was a bit of a humbling experience. Yeah. I don't know if you had anything like that, but. Well, I think of people who I think live on the, live in a way where they're nurtured by their own curiosity. I have a friend from Australia, Danielle, and Danielle's a photographer and she, I think she's always interested and I had always noticed that she would always have fascinating conversations with children. And so when she and I worked together, we had a colleague from Zimbabwe and he had, the, he had um, two children, two boys. They were about four and five. And one time she asked the five-year-old, Danielle, my friend, asked the five-year-old, what was it like when you moved to Australia? And he said, um, at first it was frightening. And then he said to her, do you know what fear is? And she said, no, I don't tell me. Mm. And he said, it's when it hurts here. Mm. What an extraordinary conversation. I've thought about that for a very long time. Do you know what fear is? And that he wasn't sure that she did and that she was the kind of person who asked a question in a way that a child would hear that question, but also hear the tone of the possibility of listening to a response. And that um, certainly wasn't a cute interaction between an adult and a five-year-old. It right. was a conversation between two people. And I think so much of that came as a result of the fact that he paid attention to the story of your life and asked her a question. And she also asked him a question and that each listened to the other yeah. and listened to themselves. What, what a way to live. We, we could use a little more of that in our world. <laughs> uh, here, here's a question uh, from uh, someone who, who goes to church here at Palmer. Uh, when I have heard you read poetry before, I expected a wise older man. <laughs> you clearly have a soul ancient. fresh and young. What sparks your creativity and fresh approach to things sacred and theological? Well, I am 46. So um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, I, what I suppose 
Yeah, like, I like people. Um, <laughs> I I read a lot of poetry, and so I'm poetry has always opened me up to the world. At the moment, because of this poetry residency with Columbia, I'm reading I don't know up to five books of poems a day, um, which can sometimes get a bit overwhelming. But uh, it is also a way of paying attention to, to where those poems are landing and to think, well, therefore, what do I see and what would I want to ask and what kind of poem would I write as a result of that? Um, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, I just like, I like being alive and mm -hmm. therefore everything is the possibility for asking a question. Uh, speaking of reading, someone wants to know what young poet, what young poets are you reading? Are you reading? Uh, what do you mean by young? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, what young poets am I reading? I'm reading so many. Um, so I've been reading uh, Kwame Dawes has this he working university does he work looking up here to where the book is um, has this great series of chapbooks from young African poets, um, which I really appreciate. The New Generation of African Poets. It's a chapbook box set of fifteen of fifteen um, chapbooks, which is a great um, publication. Uh, I've been reading uh, Ocean Vong. I really appreciate Ocean Vong. I have been reading um, Anne-Marie Nihoyrenoin, who's an Irish poet. She's got a book called The Poison Glen, which is an examination of um, mother and baby homes and orphanages and, and state-sponsored religious schools in Ireland in the 20th century. And her work is a combination of time and fury and tenderness. It's, it's really powerful. Um, yeah, loads. <laughs> so there's a couple more questions. One, um, going back to, you know, your own process of creativity and writing, someone says in response to the second poem you read, the one we talked about a bit, I am fascinated and delighted to learn that you wrote the poem following the thread of your intuition. And then figured out what and then figured out what it was about yeah um and i've heard other poets mention this too uh, can you describe your writing process a little more well sometimes it happens just where there's a, a certain music that you hear and i don't mean literal music but a, a certain curiosity that you hear that makes you think i want to explore that and often all i need to do is to capture that idea and then i can work on it when i have time um uh so yeah, sometimes it's that to just to realize to go. I've thought about this my whole life, and to think that might be worthwhile trying to write about then. And I don't mean to write about it in the abstract. I mean to write about it in the absolute concrete. I'm, I'm very interested in how we can make use of of the concrete. Marie Howe is a big influence in the way that I think about poetry, and she she speaks about the ways within which um, you can employ everyday objects in the way that you write to be part of the conversation with the abstract concept that you're trying to talk about. So, you know, for instance, you're talking about what one might be writing about time or grief or um, change. And rather than speaking about those things in the abstract, the way I'm doing now, you might talk about um, the lines on your face mm -hmm. or or the, the third Christmas that that person isn't around or whatever, just ways within which by giving something that's absolutely particular so much more is implied in the implication than would be if you were trying to describe it in the abstract. There's, there's a couple of questions that are a variation on a theme. And let, let me ask you this one. Um, uh, what makes you so open hearted and forgiving when you have been through so much? I so much appreciate how you give us the language to forgive and to work through our stuff. Um, I think I got bored of being a shit. And it's really what uh, motivates me. I, I mean, I don't know that I'm open hearted enough or, or forgiving enough. It's very kind of people to say that. And thank you. And I'll take from your question the possibility that maybe I have started. Um, ultimately, I find conflict really boring. Um, I understand trauma and I, I've carried a lot of it in my life. Um, but there is a period where I found myself wanting to go. I'm, I'm interested in not being a repeating narrative. I, I'm always interested in something that can unfold with surprise. And I think 
the attempt to live with an open heart, the attempt to say, I'm just going to say how alienated I feel, or I'm going to speak up in the context of being an artist, feeling like, oh God, I feel lonely all the time, or, you know, ordinary everyday human experiences, rather than pretending to fit in or pretending that I can follow along all the artistic references, I'm going to speak up. And I think that has usually, sometimes I just felt more humiliated, but usually it, it yields to somebody coming up afterwards and saying, oh, I'm so glad you said that. I felt the same way. Right. And you think, what a lovely surprise, because suddenly two of us are having a conversation and we have a, we have a rich connection. Uh, and when it comes to forgiveness, conflict is, is often a repetition of a, of a pattern. I mean, I'm really interested in recognizing that forgiveness and say and safety can be in powerful conversation you know usually curiosity and forgiveness can grow when you've been able to establish for yourself a modicum of safety so i'm not interested in people putting themselves in a situation of harm that's right. not forgiveness um but uh, what i am interested in is when i am safe enough um right. thinking of well what therefore might be going on and how can i extend curiosity here and how might something unpredictable happen in the future rather than which is again i'll say it again because it's it's been so abused in so many places none of that has anything to do with putting yourself back in a violent relationship or in a abusive situation or in a place where you're being taken for granted but what it does mean is that you're not being held hostage to your previous experience and where that's possible that's worthwhile doing so on, on a related note someone asking about your work with reconciliation says it's no secret that our society is more and more divided politics, pandemics, uh, social injustice, what hope do you feel or mm -hmm. forward paths do you see that might bring us together? Any baby steps one could take to begin a journey of societal reconciliation? And then the last thing is, what must one not do? Um, I mean, I, I, the idea that hope must be built on evidence is, is something that will fail us. Uh, hope must be built on hope, because if hope is only built on evidence, there'll always be reasons why the evidence will seem hollow. Um, hope is the thing with feathers, Emily Dickinson said, or she also said, hope is a subtle glutton. That was a later poem. Um, and then she also spoke about it as a strange invention. She has three hope poems. And there's a way within which looking at the way that she thought about hope throughout her life, she kept on searching for different metaphors. But each one of them was 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 based on its own kind of electricity. Um, at one point, she speaks about it as a, of this electric adjunct, not anything is known. <laughs> um, hope is a strange invention, a patent of the heart, uh, she says also. And that, I think, is a, an interesting way within which she was continuing to try to find a way where hope could be nurtured by hope. You find in the, the poetry of the prophet Ezekiel, the seeing of the God in that text as a fire burning on a fire, something that could sustain itself. Mm. And I, I think, of course, hope is nurtured by evidence. <laughs> and of course, love is nurtured by evidence. Um, but there are always going to be situations where we will find ourselves in the need to reach out for something that where the evidence seems um, slim to none, but nonetheless, where we need the very thing that we're finding it hard to find. Right. And, and that, that, I think, has been important for me to nurture, to, to pay attention to the fact that continually in the human enterprise, there are people who can nurture the flame of hope in someone, even though, and people and nurture the flame of hope in themselves, even though the evidence seems to imply the contrary. Like when you think of Joy Harjo, when I think of um, people like Wangari Matai, an extraordinary um, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, she had she was a scientist and she'd noticed that the the water in the, the the streams in the area where she had grown up had slowed down to a trickle and so much of that was because of the catholicism and imported you know the european presence in kenya where the fig trees which were a sacred symbol were being ripped up by way of getting rid of local religion but the fig tree has a deep root system and um by ripping up the fig trees the root system that was holding the soil together was taken apart and erosion began to happen and therefore access to water was limited and therefore conflict rose because people had scarcer resources of the, the most primary resource water. And so she initially planted seven trees and five of them died. And then she planted 52 million of them. <laughs> uh, the Green Belt movement in Kenya was birthed, mm -hmm. primarily planted by women. And she was given the Nobel 
Peace Prize. I'm going to forget the year, maybe 2009. Right. Wow. Somebody will be able to check it out. Krista Tippett has a beautiful interview with her and her on the resource and the On Being website. And th there is a way within which I, I think of the fact to go, well, what was nurturing her? And when you hear her speak, I'm so motivated by the fact that so often it was her curiosity and it was her imagination. And it was a simple idea that was then worked into something extraordinarily profound. And that's what gives me hope. People like her, but also knowing that maybe there was nothing, no evidence nurturing her hope, but there was a hope that was. That's one of the, again, coming back to that nurturing of curiosity, that's one of the things I love about the setting of our church. We have the, the museum district just down the street and we're across the street from Rice University. We're across the street from uh, the largest medical complex in the world, the Texas Medical Center. But then we are also across the street from the, you know, the largest park um, in Houston, uh, Herman Park. And on a related, thinking of playfulness and curiosity and uh, being out in, 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 in the world that God has made, one person had asked, would the metaphor of playfulness play a part or a role in your writing, that idea of playfulness? Yeah, it's not something I think about too much, playfulness. Um, but I, um, I certainly do enjoy playing around with language. In, in Irish, the word play is multiple words. You have a word, for, a verb, shenim, which is about when you play an instrument. And then you have a, a verb, sugra, which is about playing a game. And then a verb, imert, which is a verb about um, playing a sport. And so there's different ways of speaking about play, which I, I really appreciate because each of those um, each of those bring along different things. And there is an invocation in a very, very old Irish hymn to um, to play Alleluia in the in this in the physicality of your body. And the verb to play is is to um, it's the it's the verb being used that you'd used for playing an instrument. And so I find that really, really moving. And in English, also, we see so much, so many uses of the word play, you know, play an instrument, play sport, play a game, but also to go to see a play. <laughs> um, right. So much is, and you, you speak about the dynamics at play happening in politics at the moment or happening in, you know, the city or however you'd say that. And that I think is a really, um, uh, the word play in English goes so many ways. So I suppose partly um, I'm much more comfortable in, in the Irish imagination of conjugating those verbs. I would rarely do it in English, but I think it is probably what I am doing. <laughs> I was thinking of the uh, Irish language. Someone wants to know about the the poems that you write. Um, you know, how many like are in English versus Irish? Or do, do you oh. even think about this or does it just come naturally? And you just no, 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 no. I mean, I, I wish I were more fluent than I am. I am uh, and like my, every time I speak English, I'm, I'm influenced by the, the Irish language imagination, but I'm so self-conscious about my grammar that I have very rarely published a poem in Irish. Oh, interesting. So, okay. That was yeah. a good question then. Yeah. Well, when I pop up here, it's always the sign that it's time to end uh, this evening, um, which I don't want it to end. Um, Patrick, this was phenomenal. Uh, you speak my language and I just have to share one quick thing is on my desk. I keep a book near me uh, most of the time. And it is a book signed by Madeline Lingle. Oh, and wow. it says for Roger. And then it says Ananda hmm. and uh, Ananda, which you probably already know what that means, but it means, and, and this is what I believe you offered us tonight. Um, I know you offered it to me. Uh, Ananda means that joy in existence without which the universe will fall apart and collapse. <laughs> mm, and I, I love that. And so thank you for being with us this evening. My um, pleasure. And I want to encourage everyone to please check out uh, Hadrick's books. Um, while I was sitting here, I just ordered uh, some several things. And so uh, I'm thrilled to, to do that and thrilled to feel like I know you now. Uh, I want to uh, announce and, and let folks know uh, of our next speaker uh, coming up next month. And um, let me tell you who that is. I just dropped the piece of paper. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> here we go. Annette Gordon-Reed. Annette Gordon-Reed is the Carl M. Loeb University professor at Harvard. Gordon Reed won 16 book prizes, including the Pulitzer Prize in History in 2009 and the National Book Award in 2008 for the Hemings of Monticello, an American family. Mm -hmm. And she has a new book out. Um, her most recent book is on Juneteenth, Juneteenth. And so we look forward to welcoming her next month. 
Um, and that date is February the 16th. And so if you can mark your calendar for that and look for the registration link to be posted soon. Once again, Patrick, on behalf of Palmer, uh, the vestry, the congregation, and, and um, my heart, uh, welcome and thank you. And, and <laughs> we won't forget this night. So thanks so nice. much. And we will talk uh, soon. Thank you, everybody. Um, have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Patrick.